Um, Robert Bernstein, thank you for joining us. Um, Robert Bernstein is and has been a regular speaker uh, at NAIR and never fails to provide an enlightening and thought-provoking shiur. Um, I think no further introduction is needed than that. Robert Bernstein. Thank you, Gary. Uh, good morning to all. Uh, always a pleasure to be uh, together with uh, NAIR folk. Uh, I think I've mentioned in the past, uh, it's not the same by Zoom as uh, being in person, but uh, on the upside, <laughs> parking has never been easier. And uh, I'd like to <clears throat> focus on an aspect of this week's Parsha, which I don't think really gets the, the attention that it should in principle have on Seder night itself, for obvious reason. And that is the Korban Pesach. <clears throat> uh, I would say it doesn't get the lion's share or even the lamb's share of attention uh, currently. But of course, from the vantage point of Parsha's bow, uh, it, it really dominates the Parsha. <clears throat> and I'd like to start from within the Korban Pesach and then thematically we'll see how things uh, spin out. And I'm not sure if people have a Chumashim available. Uh, I don't know if I uh, had in mind to, <clears throat> to mention that either way, I'm not going to quote extensively from the Parsha, just one or two psukim. So for those of you who have a, a, a Chumash accessible, all, all's the better. And for those of you who don't, well, all I can say is I'm a rabbi, you can trust me. And with that, we'll begin. <clears throat> in Perik Yudbe's Pasuk Kaf Aleph, the Moshe uh, has received certain instructions about the Korban Pesach, and he uh, calls the Jewish people, by Yikra Moshe Lachol Zikne Yisrael, or he calls the elders, and says to them, Mishchu Ukechu Lachem, draw and take for yourselves. Son Lemishpechu Seichem, Flock, that is to say, a sheep or a lamb, the Shachatu Haposa. So, the way that Moshe instructs the people to initiate <clears throat> the Korban Pesach is with the words Mishchu Ukechu Lachem. Mishchu, Mishicha, draw near Ukechu Lachem and take for yourself. And the question, the Pshat question, of course, is what is the connotation of these two terms? Mishchu, draw for yourself and take. How can you draw if you haven't taken? And Rashi comments on this. Rashi says <clears throat> that it depends if you if you have, if you already have a lamb, so mishko, so draw it and, and, and get involved. And if you don't, then get hold of one. <clears throat> so according to Rashi, this phrase is two tiers, fits into two. Mishko for those who already have, and kahu for those who don't yet have. One could say it's quite a, a practical way of relating to these sukkim. But there is a fascinating comment on the word mishchu, which comes from the, the parish of Rabbeinu Bachir, Rabbeinu Bachir on the Torah. And if we wish to get the full impact of the word mishchu and see how it's such a, a watchword for the Korban Pesach, let us remind ourselves of an earlier mishchu of an earlier drawing. This is not the first time that the word Mashiach is used to draw near in the Torah. <clears throat> in Parshas Vayeshev, Parshas Perik Lamed Zayin, when there's tension between Yosef and the brothers and they throw him into a pit and then the time comes where the opportunity presents itself for him to be sold, the Pasuk says Vayim Shechu es Yosef min habor. They drew up and raised up Yosef from the pit and sold him to Mitzrayim. That is the first Vayim Shechu. And therefore, says Rabbeinu Bachya, in response to or in rectification of the first Vayim Shechu, when they sold Yosef, now when the time comes to leave Mitzrayim, the first thing to do is mishchu. That word connects these two events very closely. And really what Rabbeinu Bachia is indicating to us <clears throat> is that the sale of Yosef 
and our experiences in Mitzrayim. And we know that one led to the other. After selling Yosef, events followed until we were all there. Rabbi Nebach is informing us that the link between these two events is not merely chronological. It's causational. Somehow, the sale of Yosef resulted in our experiences in Mitzrayim, to which the redemption is then the final recovery or the fundamental recovery from the sale of Yosef. With the Mishchu of the Korban Pesach, we recover from Vayim Shechu of selling Yosef down to Mitzrayim. And this implicates, as we said very clearly on the part of Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar, that the, the events and the difficulties in Mitzrayim were a result, a direct result, caused by the sale of Yosef. And that is very interesting <clears throat> because it's worthwhile pointing out that the Gemara itself seems to imply that the sale of Yosef was a cause for the difficulties, for the experiences in Mitzrayim. Where is the Gemara? In Masechus Shabbos on Daf Yud, the Gemara makes quite a, a startling statement because it doesn't normally say things like this. Uh, Chazal and the Mepharshim after them, they normally look at what the events of Gracious, we try to learn from them, but a comment of this nature is rare to find. But it is in the Gemara in Shabbos, and the Gemara says a person should never favor one child over his other children. <coughs> and as evidence for this recommendation, the Gemara says, because consider, over the weight of two sellers worth of fine wool, referring, of course, to the Kasonas Pasim, and all the favoring that went with that, the matter spiraled downwards and emanated see what happened. Yosef was favored. It led to tensions. One thing led to the other. And before we look around, we ended up in Mitzrayim. Now, the point of the Gemara is, again, a recommendation for us, although we don't assume that uh, in our experience favoring one child should have such uh, drastic consequences but nonetheless negative is negative but what we do see from the Gemara <clears throat> is it seems to again identify us going down to Mitzrayim as a result of the episode with Yosef and the brothers those tensions and those actions taken one thing led to the other and the reason why this is such a challenging idea is because if we've been following the Torah from the beginning, and if we haven't, we should go back to the beginning. In Parshas Lech Lecha, Gracious Perek Tesvav, famous Brisbane story, and there Avram is told in very clear terms of the future exile, Yado Ateida, we know the, the words very well, Yado Ateida, Kigeri Yezarecha, Be'eretz Lalahem, Avodum, Ve'inu Osam, he's told of the subjugation and, and the, the hardships and, and all of that, which means that Chazal, in identifying the events of the brothers as the cause for the exile in Mitzrayim, they seem to have been discovering something that already exists. We already have a cause. Whatever, whatever the understanding of the Brisbane and Bessarim, it's already been set from there. It doesn't seem to, to, to be subject to some later development that happened. Had the brothers not sold Yosef, there would have been no exile in Mitzrayim. It's already been told to Avram. And this question of uh, balancing or juggling or handling these different causes for the Golas and Mitzrayim is actually raised by Tosfus themselves. Tosfus following the golden rule of Tosfus, which is thou shalt not get carried away, which means that when the Gemara makes a dramatic statement like that, you have to make sure that it, it checks out with everything else in the Torah. So again, the question simply stated is, <clears throat> how can we implicate the sale of Yosef as the cause for the Egyptian exile? Was it not foretold generations before those events? And Tosfos give uh, an answer. <clears throat> and that is that you never know how difficult things would have been or how difficult things wouldn't have been. There's many different shades of exile and persecution, which means as much as 
the entire events have already been foretold to Avram, perhaps they wouldn't have been as bad as they were were it not for the exacerbating corroborative cause of the sale of Yosef. The sale of Yosef took an already bad situation and made it significantly worse. So according to Tosfos, there are twin causes now for the goddess in Mitzrayim. There's the Bris Ben Avisarim for Avram, and there is the sale of Yosef, which added a qualitative difficulty to the experience in, in Mitzrayim. A similar kind of answer is given by another of the Rishonim, the Ritva, Rabbi Yom Tov of Seville, <clears throat> and the Ritva points out, and it's very interesting if you never noticed it, we often gloss over things and make presumptions and take things for granted. When Hashem foretold the experiences in Mitzrayim to, uh, pardon me, the experiences for Avram's descendants, he never said where they would take place. And there are many places in the world which are fit the description of Be'eretz lo lahem, a land that is not theirs, which is still exile. It's not pleasant. It's not good. But it could have been worse. Mitzrayim was worse. As if to say, the land yet hasn't been chosen. And there are other lands which, are, which perhaps could have been a milder experience for us. Be'eretz lo lahem. What led to the the choice of location of Mitzrayim, which is the worst of the worst, says the Ritva, was the sale of Yosef to Mitzrayim. So these are the, the comments of the Rishonim in terms of how to navigate the different causes as we see from the Chumash and as we see from the Gemara. But what emerges is that the sale of Yosef was an active participant in what led to <clears throat> the experiences in Mitzrayim. And the question that we, we now need to ask is, well, if the exile in, in Mitzrayim <coughs> was a result, or shall we say somehow uh, consequence of the sale of Yosef, well, how does it deal with it? In other words, was there any form of response? Did this in any way treat or deal with the forces at play with the sale of Yosef? Or is it merely, you did a bad thing and here's the punishment? But as we see, and it's a delicate point, but of course it, it, it resonates very clearly. If the problem which led to the sale of Yosef was a disunity and disharmony among the brothers, and if it starts among the brothers, it will then become among the cousins and then will become on the second cousins until it becomes uh, within the Jewish people. The subjugation in Mitzrayim for all its difficulties, had one benefit, or one of the primary benefits. And that is when the Jewish people face persecution or antagonism from without, they close ranks from within. All the differences that otherwise would have driven them apart from each other, they fade away in the face of a much more pressing concern. And that is the enmity from an enslaving nation or such like. And therefore, in a sense, the Jewish people were fused together. It's very interesting that the exile experience, the Egypt experience, is referred to later on in the Chumash as the Kur HaBarzel, as the smelting furnace. That's in Sefer Devarim, in Parshas Vaischana. And from a certain point of view, it's very interesting as we kind of sweep through the Chumashim that there's a lot of evaluation of our time in Mitzrayim that only really comes in Chumash Devarim. There are certain ways of looking at things that are only really expressed in Chumash Devarim. And perhaps what that means is the Jewish people needed to go through the whole thing and even come out of it and even be a safe distance away from it to have the perspective to look back and evaluate it in that way and appreciate it in a way that they may not have in real time or even shortly thereafter. Sometimes it takes a bit of time. As Moshe himself says, it's been 40 years and Hashem didn't give you, as the Pasuk goes, a naim l'roz, was naim l'shmoa, v'leiv l'havint ad hayom hazdeh. It took a, it took a certain percolating uh, time for the Jewish people to really appreciate that the experiences in Egypt had actually had a purifying or refining effect on them. Kur habarzal, 
What is this? What does a smelting furnace do? It refines the product. But I think we normally look at this concept of the Kur Habarzal as refining the Jewish people upwards, shall we say, taking them from a low state to a higher state somehow, to refine them to be ready to become Hashem's nation and receive the Torah. But in light of Rabbeinu Bachir's explanation, we understand that the experiences in Egypt are a kur habarzel, they're refining because they also get rid of the impurities that stop the, the entity from really unifying. Those also were, were, were uh, removed through the, the smelting process. As if to say the kur habarzel, it doesn't just refine us as people, but it refined us as a people in order to, to forge us together, which is the way that we need to be. And with this in mind, it could be that we can approach the Korban Pesach in a very different way. When we look at the Korban Pesach, it's about our freedom, but there's many elements of the Korban Pesach that actually, and the Korban Pesach really is this, it's our redemption event. But if redemption is recovery from the sale of Yosef, so how do we see that in the Korban Pesach? But we do. The first thing we find about the Korban Pesach is that it's meant to be eaten le mishpachoseichem, the whole family together. And that is already a statement about the fact that this is a response to the sale of Yosef. If the sale of Yosef was that the family was fragmenting, the Korban Pesach is a Korban around which the entire family should be, should situate themselves and partake of. And it's especially interesting when we remember that what is the first thing that the brothers did after they sold Yosef? As the Pasuk tells us, they sat down and they had a meal together. And what is the point of that meal? It doesn't just mean they were hungry after a hard day's uh, selling. It meant that they were consolidating what remained of the family. Food brings people together. We're all Jewish. I think we understand that very well. <coughs> and to have a, a, a meal around something is really to consolidate things. And therefore, when they sold Yosef, they sealed that and they sealed themselves together by Yeshu Lecho Lechem. And, and that, but that was a meal that excluded one of the brothers. The Korban Pesach says, do it again, with no one being excluded. And that's why the, the, the halakha emphasizes that it should be eaten all in one place. The makom echad, again, not here and there, all centered around something. And there's a fascinating comment of the Maharal. He says it in a slightly different context, but we can certainly adduce it for, uh, for our uh, discussion. As we know, unlike other korbanos, the Torah is very specific as to how the Korban Pesach should be prepared. After all, there's many ways to prepare something through heat. And yet, as we know, with regards to the Korban Pesach, eino ne'echal ela tzolui. It can only be roasted. That's very interesting. Why should it have to be roasted? We dare we ask. Manishtana korban hazeh mikola korbonos. All the other korbonos can be, which is in fact is the question of the Manishtana in the original version. At the time of the Beis HaMikdash, as the Mishnah tells us in the 10th Barak of Sachim, the child is asking, you can prepare meat however, you can cook it, you can roast it, you can do whatever you want. But tonight, it's only roasted. And there's many explanations in Rishonim, but the Maharal says a fascinating thing. There's many ways to prepare food through heat or meat through heat. But of all of them, roasting has the opposite effect of the other. Because when you prepare with liquid, actually the particles of meat become looser and more apart from each other than, and, and easier to separate from each other than otherwise. Which of course is not the case. When you roast something, actually the whole thing comes closer and closer together. And it's harder in fact to, to, to prise it apart. And therefore in a sense, the Jewish people undergo a kind of a roasting uh, experience, and that's really what what, it, what Golis Mitzrayim was to bring them together in that way. It cannot be prized apart, and that's reflected in the way the Korban Pesach is prepared.
very interesting, really down to the method of preparation. It's all about togetherness because that's really the recovery from the, the lack of togetherness represented by the sale of Yosef. <clears throat> and what's even more interesting is this, I think, will give us, and this is pointed out by Rabbi Paiman Zatzal, the, the Rav of the Groshul in Bayer Begun, that, uh, as we know, in, in last week's Parsha, already two weeks ago, <clears throat> when Hashem appears to Moshe, it's very puzzling, the, the burning bush and the, the redemption is nigh, and the time has come, and Moshe hears it from no less than Hashem himself. And, it, and according to Chazal, Rashi quotes it, he argues for seven days. He doesn't want to go, which is unbelievable. In seven days is a long time, even not in politics. But certainly, Hashem is telling you the time has come. And Moshe says no. But why does he say no? Because, and Rashi again quotes, Moshe feels Aaron is older. He's been with the people the whole time. He's the, he's the natural choice. And Moshe doesn't want Aaron to be upset. And until Hashem assures him, that in, on, on the highest authority, on the infinitely highest authority, that, that Aaron will not be upset. Moshe doesn't want to go. But, but how can he object based on this ground? It's, it's very nice that he doesn't want Aaron to be upset. But this whole uh, dynamic takes on a completely new dimension now. Because once we appreciate that the whole of the, or not the whole of, but a significant part of the Egypt exile experience was on account of the younger brother being favored over the other brothers. And they're just finally recovering from that. So for Moshe, the worst thing to possibly happen is for that to, to all be reopened by another brother being favored over another brother. That's, we're just recovering from that. And now we're being redeemed from that through that very same dynamic. And that's why Moshe is so resistant to, to what might be perceived as usurping Aaron's place, because if, if redemption from Egypt is, is all about brotherhood, it can't come at the expense of the feelings of one of the brothers. Very interesting. We're, we're, we're familiar with this idea, but just to see it cast in this light, I think, is, uh, gives a completely di a different, deeper understanding. And how does this all come together? We look at Yitzhak Mitzrayim uh, as the process of becoming Hashem's nation. And here we're now seemingly discussing a very different dynamic, namely the process of coming together. So, of course, the critical question is, well, what's it all about? Is it about coming closer to Hashem to become his people? Or is it about becoming closer together to each other? But the answer, of course, is yes. These two things define each other. The Jewish people leave Mitzrayim to become Hashem's people, but they can only fully be Hashem's people the extent to which they're together with each other. Because it's only the one entity, which is called Am Yisrael, that fully connects with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. As we say uh, in our, it's based on the Pasuk in Debra Hayyama, but we say it on Shabbos Mincha, Umi Ka'amcha Yisrael, because Hashem is Echad, Ata Echad, so you are one. Umi ka'amcha Yisrael goy echad ba'aretz. And who is like Hashem? Who is like uh, your people, Israel? One nation. As if to say, because of Isaac Chaver, what that means is because Hashem is echad. So Am Yisrael are ka'amcha Yisrael when they are goy echad, when they are together. And therefore, the closer the Jewish people come to each other, the closer they come to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, which is ultimately the goal and uh, ultimate purpose of. Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. But this is one aspect, one element within the Korban Pesach representing the unification of the Jewish people, which is a response to one of the primary causes as emerges for their goddess in the first place, fragmentation as expressed by the sale of Yosef. <laughs> and from there, I'd like to move to, uh, to discuss it different aspect of the Korban Pesach, and we'll begin by referring to a different mitzvah entirely. And that's the mitzvah of Tzitzis. Tzitzis, of course, although we don't meet it yet, it's not until Parshas Shalach, but it's very much connected to Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. The Parsha of Tzitzis, which we recite every day, ends with Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And 
And indeed, Rashi, in his commentary to, at the end of Parshas Shalach, he cites his Rebbe, Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. Chumash Bamidbar Rashi quotes very often uh, Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. Whenever the Rashis swell to a Ramban length, it's probably because of Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan. And <clears throat> Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan says, if, you, if we understand that tzitzis is almost like the, the garment representation of leaving Mitzrayim, it explains to us many aspects of the mitzvah of tzitzis, aspects and terminology. The first thing we find is that the tzitzis are suspended from the corner, and the corners are called kanaf, kanfei, al kanfei vigdehem, lederosa. Now, kanfei means a corner, but the word kanfei, says Rabbi Moshe Adarshan, has already been used in the Torah with reference to Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim. That is when Hashem says, I took you out on eagle's wings. So the word kanfei in the first context means wings, in the second context means corners, but the word itself is uh, an asso associative link, kanfei, kanfei from Tzitzis to Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim. And moreover, the halacha is that it's specifically a garment of four corners, arba kanfost. Why four corners? Says Rabbi Moshe Adarshan, in connection with and association with the arba lashonus of Geula, which we know so well, otsesi, talti, alti, akachti. Those are the four, they become the four points of suspension of Tzitzis. And finally, for, our, for purposes of our discussion. There are eight threads. There are eight strings <coughs> of tzitzis. Why eight? Says Rabbi Moshe Darshan, because these correspond to the eight days from the time we left Mitzrayim until the time of Az Yashir, to the time of Kriyat Yamsu and singing Az Yashir. So everything checks out. The kanfei, the four kanfos, the eight, the eight strings, correspond to those eight days. There's just one problem, and it's pointed out very quickly by many Mepharshim, <clears throat> and that is there aren't eight days. Because we left Mitzrayim on the 15th of Nisan, and then Kriyas Yamsuf and Az Yashir is on the 21st of Nisan. And it's very easy to track because we read it on the seventh day of Pesach. So we have a problem. Rabbi Moshe Darshan explains eight threads based on eight days between leaving Mitzrayim and Az Yashir. We happen to know that there were seven. So if there's seven days, how can you say there were eight? <clears throat> I think in discussion, it's normally very important not to lose the thread they say, but in this instance, it might not sound like such a bad idea. So <clears throat> that is the question. But the answer to this question may take us even deeper into the concepts that we call Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, leaving Mitzrayim. What is the goal of leaving Mitzrayim? Well, that's not a secret. The Torah states it explicitly. And once again, in the Parsha of Tzitzis. I took you out of Mitzrayim, says Hashem. Why? For what goal? The goal of leaving Mitzrayim was in order to become Hashem's people. And the truth is, and this again, it's a, it's a deeper idea, and it's itself actually very challenging, but we come back to the Torah's description of the exile in Egypt as Kur HaBarzel, as the, as the refining, smelting furnace. And the conclusion necessarily is that we were prepared to become Hashem's people. The process that prepared us to become Hashem's people was not just leaving Mitzrayim. It was being in Mitzrayim. Even the difficulties, however it works, and, and the, it really needs to be expanded upon <clears throat> as its own discussion, but the refining process of the difficulties in Mitzrayim we're also part of the goal of the redemption, which is to refine the Jewish people 
to be able to become a Shem speaker. And this now gives a different vista on what we're celebrating on Pesach. It's very easy and it's not wrong to look upon Pesach as, as the, the time of our national freedom. That's true. But that's not the end of the, of the discussion. That's a means to an end because the end is to become Hashem's people. <clears throat> There's a very interesting comment of the Meshach Ochma. If we're still in Perik Yud Beis, just to turn back to Pasuk Yud Dalet. And there the words are, uh, Shem, uh, uh, Moshe says about, we're still Hashem talking to Moshe. V'chagosem <clears throat> oso chag l'ashem l'doroseichem. You shall celebrate it as a festival to Hashem for your generation. Chukas olam techagu shall be an everlasting statue. Says Meshachachma, what does this mean? Is it just saying you have to celebrate Pesach every year? That's what it sounds like. But the point is, says Meshachachma, there's two ways that you can celebrate Pesach. You can celebrate Pesach as, as what we could call Chag Lachem, your festival, as if to say, celebrating your freedom. We could celebrate it as Chag Lashem, the festival of you connecting with Hashem as his people. What's the difference between those two? The difference, says Meshachachma, is very clear. We don't always have our political freedom. We haven't always had it. But if that's what Pesach is celebrating, then Pesach isn't always a time for celebration. If Pesach was only Chag Lachem, I don't think any nation has ever celebrated its independence once it lost it. That's, 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 a, that's a mockery. But we celebrate Pesach every year because what we're celebrating as Chag Lashem, our connection with Hashem, was never lost. And that's why the Pasuk says, you celebrate Pesach, Chag Lashem, Chukas Olam Techagu, you will celebrate it every year because you will never have lost what you gained there. But if we, if we come to see the purpose and the full definition of leaving Mitzrayim as becoming Hashem's people, it may lead us to a startling conclusion. And that is that the redemption significantly began even before we left Mitzrayim. Once we define the redemption as becoming Hashem's people, the first step in that redemption took place even before we left. Of course, it wasn't completed until seven weeks later at Har Sinai, but it began before we left. And why do we say that? Because the full definition of leaving Mitzrayim is to become Avdi Hashem, Hashem's people, Hashem's servants. What do, Ava, what do Avdi Hashem do? Avodas Hashem. And what is the first act of Avodas Hashem that we had as a nation? The Avoda of Korban Pesach. In other words, the night before we actually left Mitzrayim, we were already beginning to actualize the goal of leaving Mitzrayim, even before we left. If the goal, as is stated in Shemos, Ta'avdun Esa Elokim al to serve Hashem at Har Sinai, the process of Avoda began with the Korban Pesach. And this, again, I think, casts the Korban Pesach <clears throat> in a completely new light. Because it's not just, quote unquote, a mitzvah, and it's not just, quote unquote, a korban. It represents the initial step of our connecting to Hashem as his servants and as his people. And this will explain to us why there is such a stringency attached to bringing the Korban Pesach. The laws of the Korban Pesach are, are much more uh, stringent than, than many other laws. We know, for example, <clears throat> if a person neglects willfully to bring the Korban Pesach, uh, he, he's liable for kares, which is a very serious penalty. It's a penalty, not only do you almost never find it, but you, but you never find a penalty of any kind for neglecting a positive mitzvah. All the penalties in the Torah are for violating a negative mitzvah, not take a tray for violate Shabbos. And, and that's when the penalties come in. 
for neglect of fulfilling a positive mitzvah, you never find a penalty and certainly not one so extreme. I say never, I mean, of course, almost never. There is one famous example, famous exception, and that is Mila, where the Pasuk says in Lech Lecha, the person neglects, right? His parents neglected, and then he neglects uh, to, 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 to perform Mila. He's Chayev Kar, it's Benichrasa, Arshaz Lech Lecha. Why? Because Mila is not just a mitzvah, it's a bris, it's a covenant. To neglect that mitzvah is to opt out of the covenant, of that, of that connection as part of Hashem's people. And that has very drastic consequences. But what we now understand is that the sister mitzvah, which also has such dark consequences for its neglect, the Korban Pesach, it has the same consequences as Mila for its neglect because it is in the same category of Mila. It's a bris. This is when the Jewish people initiated their connection with Hashem as his people. And therefore, to neglect to bring the Korban Pesach, it's like, it's like uh, abdicating on the bris. And that's why the penalty is the same for one who does so, the penalty of Karas. But it also explains to us, and I think gives us a, a, an enhanced understanding of what it means to bring the Korban Pesach every year. And the more we ponder this, perhaps we'll, the more we'll miss the Korban Pesach. And that's not such a bad thing. If we're missing it, we may as well miss it. Because when the Korban Pesach is brought every year, if the original act of bringing the Korban Pesach was to initiate the bris between Hashem and the Jewish people, the connection, but now we understand that bringing the Korban Pesach every year is not just a yearly commemoration of that connection. It's a yearly renewal of that connection. And that's why the penalty of Kares can come on any given year because the person has, he may have brought the Korban Pesach last year. That's good for last year. The relationship is renewed every year. A person can't miss a year. And this understanding of Korban Pesach, it's the beginning of, of our intimate connection and association with Hashem as his people. It, it will give us, a, again, new insight into many other aspects of what accompanied the Korban Pesach. As we know, <clears throat> Hashem says that you should take the blood of the Korban and you should smear it on the, the, on the doorposts and on the lintel. And when I see that, I'll pass over. And, and, and the Korban, or whatever Pesach means, Rashi says Pesach means to pass over. Uncle says Pesach means I'll, I'll have pity on you, Rachmanus on you. Either way. That becomes the name of the Korban, Korban Pesach. Now, the name of a Korban, we assume, reflects the essence of the Korban. But this doesn't seem to be of essential meaning at all. In other words, there were a, a hundred things that were true of the Korban Pesach. It happens to be that if you had the blood on the doorpost, so Hashem would, would pass over. But the, I don't think any of us would have thought to give the name Pesach to the Korban based on that detail. Clearly, it's not just the detail. <clears throat> there is a fascinating, uh, it's actually the Gemara Maseches Psachim in the ninth parent. We look upon the smearing of the, the blood on the doorpost and on the lintel as a sign for whatever that means, for whatever reason Hashem needs a sign. But actually, there's more to it than that. As we know, when it comes to halachas, Pardon me, when it comes to korbanos, so one of the primary parts of the elements of the, the avoda, the service of the korban, is the application of the blood. That's the first thing that happened. We know from Ezu Makoman, with which we, I think, are uh, uh, hopefully familiar, the Shechita and Kibul Daman. <clears throat> Not everyone always gets to say all the Mishnais of Ezu Makoman. Uh, my father was uh, fond of saying, if a person ever comes late for davening, the first thing to be sacrificed to the korbanos. But be that as it may, we, we're familiar enough <clears throat> to know that these, the, the, the blood is, is, is received and then and sprinkled on the mizbeach. It is a core part. It is the essential part of the avoda, avoda sada. 
So that leads us to an interesting Shiloh. Korban Pesach. Where did this happen? Where is the Mizbeach? Without it, we don't seem to have the basic building blocks of the procedure of a Korban. Where is the Mizbeach? And the Gemara in Pesachim says a, a, a surprising thing, an unbelievable thing. And that is the doorposts and the lintel of the houses with the Mizbeach. The application of the blood to those places took the form of, or achieved the, 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 the purpose of, and fulfillment of the, the application of the blood of the Korban. What that means is on that historic occasion, on that very first Korban Pesach, the houses of the Jewish people became like the Beis Hamikdash, and their doors became like a Mizbeach, and the whole place was elevated. It was truly, truly a unique situation. No one looks at their doorpost and sees a Mizbeach. But on that event, that is exactly what happened. And therefore, when Hashem says that I will pass by, and if I see the blood on the doorpost, I'll pass over the house, what it means is it's not just a marker to say, Korban in, in progress, <clears throat> but rather it's a demonstration that this house belongs to Hashem and therefore it's vouchsafed from, the, from the, any damage that could happen through the plague. And therefore <clears throat> what the blood represents is the, is the entire elevation of the people and their attachment to Hashem. That's what resulted in him passing over the house. And that's why the name of the, of the Korban is Korban Pesach. In this respect, it tells us everything about the essence of the Korban. The Korban is about connecting us to Hashem, as was reflected in Hashem passing over the house of anyone who was thus connected. And in fact, this will explain to us another thing. Without getting too much into the <clears throat> halachas of Korban Pesach, I know it is Sunday also here, even though they don't exist really here. In Israel, but <coughs> nonetheless, uh, some people refer to them as Shabbos Sheni Shalgolios. Um, either way, the the role of eating the korban pesach is very prominent, much more than with other korbanos. There's, there's a number of korbanos where where you know the the the, the meat of the korban is consumed either by the kohanim or by the the person who brought the korban. That's true but it is much more pronounced in the Korban Pesach. You find, for example, if all those who have collaborated to bring a Korban Pesach, if none of them are actually capable of eating the Korban, it's possible. So says the Mishnah in Sochim. If no one can partake of it, the whole thing is possible. That's not true for other Korban. If for some reason the entire community is, is Tomei, and we know that if everyone's Tomei, the majority or everyone's Tomei, they bring a Korban Pesach anyway, the halacha is they can bring it and they can eat it. That's not true for other Korbanos that can be brought in a state of Tumor. You can bring the Korban, but you can't partake of it. But with the Korban Pesach, if you bring it, you can eat it. Because the whole, there's no bringing without eating. So much so that uh, the Rambam, for those that track these things in the Rambam's listing, and we know that the Rambam, <clears throat> he does not count details of a mitzvah as separate mitzvahs of the 613. If it's a detail, it's subsumed within the, the mother mitzvah or the father mitzvah or whatever. And the eating of a korban is subsumed within the mitzvah of the korban itself, in most cases. The exception to the rule is Korban Pesach. The Rambam lists eating the Korban Pesach as a separate mitzvah from everything else involved in the Korban. And, and what this gives us to understand more and more is that there's something about the Korban Pesach that, that partaking of the Korban is much more of the essence than it is with other Korban. But why? <clears throat> the truth is, says Rebleib Minsberg, and he's, I'm not sure if that's the name with which we're familiar, Rebleib Minsberg, one of the greats of Yerushalayim, passed away just a couple of years ago. When you think about it, the entire concept of partaking of a korban, of people eating from a korban, is 
completely mind-boggling. Because what is a korban? It's been sanctified for Hashem. In our conception, if you sanctify something for Hashem, so give it to him. And what does that mean? Burn it on the Mizbeach or send it up and so on and so forth. It's incredible that we give something to him and then we start eating it. But that's what, a, that's what happens with a korban. But why? The Rebbe Minsberg says, what that, what that means is, if you, if you offer a korban, it belongs to Hashem. But if you partake of it, that means that you also belong to Hashem. And you, in, the, in the words of the Gemara, that you're eating from the table of on high. If that is, is and korban means karov, that's how close you are to Hashem, that you give something to him and he lets you have some of it back. So if eating from a korban represents closeness to Hashem, and that's how it's true with korbanos generally, that's now we understand why when it comes to korban Pesach, it is of the essence. It is a matter of priority because korban Pesach is when that connection began. And therefore, when it comes to korban Pesach, you, it is not a, a, a side point or a detail within the mitzvah. The idea of partaking from Hashem's table representing our relationship with Hashem, that is something that Pesach, that's really what Pesach is all about. And that's why it's so emphasized in the Korban Pesach. <clears throat> so let us now just uh, return to the Yamsuf and clear up a couple of, uh, of loose ends. We began the second part of our discussion by referring to the question of the Mepharshim. Rabbi Moshe Hadarshan explains the details of Tzitzis among them, the eight strings of tzitzis as corresponding to the eight days from when we left Mitzrayim. But of course, someone then came and did a count and noticed that there's only seven days. So why do we say eight? And many Mepharshim explain that when Rabbi Moshe Darshan says there's eight days from Yetzirah Mitzrayim till, till Shira Sayyam, he's not talking about the 15th of Nisan when we left till the 21st. He's talking about the 14th of Nisan when we brought the Korban Pesach. Because with, as far as the mitzvah of tzitzis is concerned, which is lihiyos lachem lenukim, which is about all four expressions of ge'ula, botseisi v'itzalti v'ga'alti and v'lakachti eschem li la'am, becoming Hashem's people, that's something that was initiated the day before we left Mitzrayim. And therefore, from a tzitzis point of view, the count begins on the 14th, and there are ultimately eight days. Just to conclude with two fascinating points, one from Halacha, one from Shuta Shamikra, for this idea, Maral points out, uh, interestingly, as much as we say that Pesach begins on the 15th, and in many respects, of course, it does, but there are Halachas of Pesach that already begin on a Torah level from the 14th, even in terms of, 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 of Chometz. Chometz is also from the Torah already, from Chatzos. As from the time that you bring the Korban Pesach, it's already Pesach from a certain point of view. If Pesach is reflected by not eating chametz, so then that's already in place from the time that you bring the Korban Pesach. The mitzvah of matzah will yet wait till the 15th. But halachically, we already see the halachas of Pesach uh, on, on the 14th. And finally, the 14th of Pesach has, has an unusual uh, title in our parsha. When is the mitzvah to destroy Chometz? The day before Pesach. And what is it called? The Yom Harisha. You look in Pasuk Tesvav, a period of days. But on the Yom Harisha, get rid of Chometz. When is the Yom Harisha? We know that the mitzvah to destroy Chometz is not just on Pesach, it's on the day before. Somehow, the day before, is called Yom Harisha. And <clears throat> you may know the Gemara Imsachim and Dafhei, Rashi quotes some of it to explain how the word Rishon can refer to the day before the first day. Maybe it means the prior day, as, as Rashi explained. But there's an amazing comment of the Taz, the Ture Zahav, on Shulchan Aruch, who says that the reason why the 14th is called the Yom Harishon is because from a certain point of view, it really is the Yom Harishon. This is day one of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. You haven't left yet. There are two day ones. You could almost say there's two clocks of redemption. In terms of becoming Abdi Hashem, that's from the 14th. 
And in that respect, 14th is the first day of Pesach. As much as you need to work it out, that it's the 14th, not the 15th, but it is not incorrect, even on a pshat level, to refer to the 14th as the Yom Rishon. So these are certain themes and perspective. And again, I think when, when, when in our Seder night, we don't give the Korban Pesach its due for obvious reasons uh, currently, all the more reason from within the context of Parsha's bow to see, take a good look at the Korban Pesach and what it's wired into to the sale of Yosef, as we saw, and to the, the ultimate tablet of Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim. So my friends, it's been a great pleasure uh, being together with you to share some words of Torah, and uh, we should always be zochah to be together uh, for Torah things. And before too long, we should be zochah le'echel min azvachim u'min apsachim that time should come soon. All the very best. Um, we have uh, an opportunity for questions. If anyone has a question, please, um, please speak now. Uh, Michael Gilbert. Your Emmanuel. Just a, a thought on the whole issue and the sequence of events leading to Yitzhak Mitzrayim and the Korban Pesach. Had it not been for the intervention of Ruvain and Yehuda, we might still be waiting. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Michael. Um, Rabbi Bernstein, Yishakar for a, a fascinating share focusing on the Korban Pesach. Uh, I, for one, intend to listen to it again in preparation for this coming Pesach. Um, and the shear you've given really feels like continuity of the uh, weekly shear that your late father used to give as well at, at the shul. Hugely, hugely appreciated. So thank you very much. My pleasure. All the very best to know you, Thank you very much. Um, at this